everyone and I would like to welcome you all to our webinar. This webinar is a practical workshop on how to develop and deploy DynamML solution on an ESP32 device. A little bit about us. Actus is a Danish-born electronic engineering consultancy that was founded back in 2007 by two Danish engineers in the vibrant city of Vibor. Today, we are a force of over 120 dedicated individuals spread across six offices in Denmark, Ukraine and Slovenia. We offer an end-to-end -end solution with our three core business areas, electronics development, type testing and approvals, and electronics manufacturing services. Our largest business area is development, with more than 50 talented engineers with expertise spanning a wide range of domains. We tackle complex challenges and deliver cutting-edge solutions to our clients of all sizes across sectors. Enough said. For today's webinar, my colleague Alex and I will present you the next topics. Firstly, we will recap what we have learned on our previous webinar. Secondly, we will approach data logging. We will describe how we collected the data needed for our project. And in the step number three, we will show you how to clear and make sure that the data is prepared for the step number four, model development. Model development is the heart of project. We will create a smart algorithm that will make sense of our data and perform the expected output. Number five is model reporting and validation. We will move the smart algorithm onto a powerful platform and make sure that it, it works like a charm. Then, uh, as a step number six, we will wrap up everything and quickly summarize what we have achieved, what we have learned and what might come next. Last but not least, of course, we will give you a sneak peek into our next adventure. We are going to dive into machine learning on ESP32 in our upcoming webinar. Exciting stuff, isn't it? And now I'm passing my mic to Alexander and he will dive deeper into our first section, the case recap and presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome once again to our webinar. I'm Alexander Lubimov, the business director of electronics development department at Actos. With regards to the case recap, we have been working with Express ESP32 module that is called Virum32, and we have been porting the existing network and uh, model to the module. It's a very niche and nice product. And uh, very nice, uh, very nice uh, product uh, used. Um, actually, we had a customer product which we cannot show because of uh, NDA. But uh, it's it's very similar to the one you can see uh, on the right side of the picture, um, and that project uh, that product was uh, actually the the sensor uh, product where we used um, uh, different sensor uh, sensors fusion to actually um, get single uh, binary output uh, where we wanted to understand if the cleaning in the in the particular premise or room or the apartment was actually uh, done in an appropriate manner so that was the the idea and uh, for doing that we used a particular fusion of, of different sensors like relative humidity and temperature uh, CO2, uh, volatile, uh, organic, um, whatever particles uh, sensor, and and then um, light sensor, and and also apparently different uh, other sensors like microphone and stuff like that. the The way we assess the data for our model is actually uh, use timer, so we can we can understand the you know the time frame where the data was uh, captured. And, and changed, we, we have been looking in the particular relative humidity price and then uh, changes in, in the CO2 and VOC sensors. So that's that's the use case we'll be concentrating tonight. If we want to look a little bit 
back into the major part of the presentation we did last time, we actually concentrated on uh, on the process, explaining you how how the process of developing something based on, on the machine learning looks like. And here, not going in very deep into details, I would like to stress your attention to the few major points. First one is apparently get your requirements settled so you know what you want to construct. Then you come up with, with an architecture diagram so you understand actually the, the way you're going to make your product. Then we do data logging so we, we actually know um, uh, we know how to and, and what kind of data we want to analyze. And, and all these can be done by, by a software person or both at the customer side and also uh, as part of the what the team delivers. Then we go to, to the process of actually crunching the data where we need data scientists like the arena uh, to, to look into actually what, what we can see in the data, how, how we can get a clue what happens with the data. And what is really important here is to onboard the product owner because when we want to understand the data, we want to combine your you know, product DNA knowledge to, to the data sets we, we can see uh, from the product, from the sensor. And then when all this is done, so we, we have kind of labeled the data, you will, you will see later what it means. Then we go to the particular model training and validation, and then we rush down to actually more or less typical development process where we have to migrate algorithms from either flowcharts, if you are taking the classical control algorithms idea, or just um, whatever uh, business logic written based on use cases or whatnot. And then, then when we have uh, the binary uh, algorithms ready, uh, then we verify the firmware uh, on actually the target system, an embedded system, and then we kind of loop it back to um, to even date logging. If you can see that the, the performance of the system we have just designed and trained the model and labeled the data, it doesn't work. If it doesn't work like, like we want, then we obviously move move into, into the next round of assessing the data. So that's that's basically um, what what we do, and this is how how the process of developing products based on machine learning looks like. And now, uh, basically, we will be uh, more or less walking through the steps here, uh, and we'll be uh, looking into more practical explanation how you can use tools, how you can use different approaches, how you get a, a clue of of how to work with all these uh, strange boxes you can see on the process description. And to be able to do that, I want to pass the control of the slides to uh, to the Rina so she can continue um, the, the presentation. Um, so the Rina, the floor is yours. So please, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hi everyone. And today I will be walking you through the whole process from data logging to deploying your solution into ESP32 board. And shall we start with the presentation? Uh, first off, uh, we start with data logging. Of course, uh, we can use already pre-made data sets, but in other ca our case, we collected it um, by ourselves and uh, of course, cleaned it as well for ourselves. Um, as, uh, as you already know, uh, we used five sensors in order to predict whether cleaning is happening or not. It's related to humidity, CO2, organic compounds, ambient light, and temperature. And the measurements were taking every 10 seconds, uh, which gave us uh, flexibility you know, to control and clean our data in further steps. Uh, here you can see the, I hope you can see um, the chunk of data. Uh, it's an example uh, how we receive our data from sensors. And uh, first I would like to walk you through the flow, um, starting from the change of our environment, uh, starting from the natural response on some sprays or water used during clean cleaning. Uh, the sensors on our board catch the change of the environment and make the measurements uh, which uh, 
is saved on the SD card uh, that is uh, installed uh, in our board, in our uh, ESP32 device. After some time, uh, we collect this SD card and uh, save our data. In the future, we will use a raw data term. The data we receive uh, right from sensors is called raw data because it uh, has not been pre-processed and uh, it was simply just uh, got from our sensors. Uh, next step for us is um, data preparation. Um, here you can see on this video uh, the terminal and how it looks to the developer to collect the data. Of course, we use C language and ESP IDF uh, in order to uh, make uh, build the firmware for our device and uh, look into the details behind uh, and to collect uh, the data. So the next step is uh, data preparation. Uh, data is really important and cleanliness, uh, consistency of your data plays a huge role. Uh, we as humans uh, learn from books and each book we read uh, has some impact on us. The same happens to ML models. Uh, so we should really pay attention to the food we give them, uh, to the data uh, that we push into them. Um, so first we start with raw data, uh, which we get from uh, the previous step. And in order to achieve the cleanliness and consistency, we should clean the duplicates because um, duplicates might cause bias, uh, and which means that our model will be screwed and we won't get uh, as accurate result as we expect to get. The next step is deleting anomalies. Uh, it also has huge anomalies also have a huge impact uh, on the performance of our model. So you should be uh, aware if uh, there are some of them and clean them properly. The next step is labeling of our data. Uh, so basically what we have, we have our clean data after uh, first two steps. And uh, we have stems where uh, cleaning uh, were conducted. Um, so basically the start and the end uh, of each cleaning session. And we combine them and uh, cutting into windows. Um, so to say, I'm gonna show you the next slide. You'll see here the GIF image, uh, how the window slides through the whole data. So basically it's the chunks we uh, teach our model on. Um, initially we have, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the file with label timestamps um, containing uh, date of cleaning, start and end timestamps, and location. Uh, in our case, we observed two floors um, of our office. In your case, you can use as many as you want. Um, and raw data, the data we obtained from sensors. Uh, and uh, our windows, uh, why 30 minutes, you may ask. And I will answer you because uh, the 30 minutes are based on our observations. Uh, the minimum time required for a proper cleaning is 30 minutes. That's why we've decided to proceed with, with uh, this number. And uh, 30 minutes for us uh, is chunk of uh, 180 uh, measurements. Here you can see on the GIF that uh, by labels, we mean this uh, red uh, sections. And uh, of course, um, in this case, data is not balanced. So we need to balance it uh, prior training the model and developing uh, model. 
next step is model development. Uh, uh, talk a bit uh, our, about our case and what we want to achieve. Uh, first off, uh, we have our data uh, and we don't know what to do with it, of course. And we have our requirements and uh, the expected output that light will flash with green or red. Um, the light will flash with green when cleaning is happening and red when cleaning is not happening, respectively. So uh, based on our data, uh, 30 minute windows and our question um, and expected output, uh, we can state that we will be solving a binary classification problem and we will be answering the question, has cleaning happened during the past 30 minutes? So let's proceed with this. Uh, here on the slide, you can say, uh, um, you, you, you can see uh, the architecture of our model. The known information that we push into the model is uh, are the data chunks, um, 180 measurements, uh, five sensors each. And uh, we expect yes or no from the model or as I mentioned earlier, we expect one or zero. Uh, on the slide, we can see the layers and I will uh, show you uh, in a time uh, how the data flows from start to the end. So first, when we have the data, we pass it to the input layer. Input layer only receives the data and then pushes it into a flattened layer Flatten layer helps us uh, to flatten our data and uh, turn this 2D matrix, matrix uh, into 1D array. Next step is uh, the calculation itself. Uh, hidden layers behind this model, in this model, uh, do all the job and uh, apply weights and biases stored in dense layers um, in order to uh, achieve our out, in order to push uh, our answers into output layer, which will give us uh, the expected numbers, uh, one cleaning, zero non-cleaning. Um, here on the bottom, you can see uh, if the number of neurons uh, in each layer. So first layer has uh, 230 neurons. After that, we have dropout. Uh, what is dropout? Dropout uh, is the uh, percentage of the connections between layer number one and layer number two, uh, which are not considered in the next uh, step of calculation. So basically model forgets 30% of uh, previously established uh, weights. Then uh, layer number two, which has uh, 490 neurons inside. Again, drop out 10%. And uh, layer number three, uh, the last layer within uh, hidden layer section. It has 270 neurons inside. And here on the bottom, you can see overall number of trainable, non-trainable parameters. And in order to uh, know the size of your uh, model, you should simply add the uh, eight these numbers here. Uh, and output layer uh, employing sigmoid fun. Uh, employing, sorry, uh, yes, sigmoid function gives us uh, the output number um, one or zero or, or something close to one or zero. Here you can see the video of uh, my collab notebook. First off, we start with uh, installing packages and uh, downloading our data. After that, we get rid of imbalances um, and uh, split our data set into training and testing data sets. 
Uh, training data set will be used for training and of course testing for the final evaluation before um, porting our model and optimizing it. Um, and then uh, before uh, starting with training and evaluation process, we should of course initialize our model. Um, we, by initializing our model, I mean creating zero uh, weights and biases uh, according to the architecture I have shown you on this slide. Um, to initialize the model, we use TensorFlow and my, multiple libraries. We use these libraries as well for our model training and evaluation process. Um, model training time uh, depends solely on the number of parameters and optimizers you use. Uh, in our case, I use uh, Adam optimizer and the number of parameters you already saw on the pre previous slide. And uh, as a result of the step, we receive our full scale uh, trained model. And uh, of course, uh, it would wor work great on our device, but when it comes to constraints in terms of uh, space, uh, we should uh, take care of uh, being able to uh, port it on small edge devices. So next step is porting and validation. Model porting. Uh, so uh, before porting the model, uh, we should uh, transform it, we should quantize it. In our case, we used the technique called uh, post-training quantization um, to be more precise, full integer quantization. Uh, during uh, the process, uh, we, uh, we transform our weights and biases from float uh, format to integer format. The next step is uh, creating a binary file of, file of this model and, uh, of course, uh, putting it into our firmware and uh, deploying it uh, to the board. What we want to achieve with this step is a, uh, make the device able to respond to our need. So device receives the sen uh, data from sensors and give us the answer, uh, our uh, green or red flashing light lights. Here you can see the terminal and how it goes. Um, in this step, we are as well using a uh, sync language and ESP IDF. Um, yes, uh, but uh, during the uh, working uh, during the working process of the model, we still uh, collecting data in order to retrain and enhance our uh, performance in the future. And of course, validation. Uh, during the validation step, uh, we uh, collect uh, some sample data that model has never seen before and uh, make it run through the big model, big, big uh, version of the model and quantized version of the model on the device. And uh, here you can see the GIF image, uh, how the window goes and evaluates uh, the performance. Um, and uh, we uh, after after the uh, our study case, uh, we have received uh, such results. Balanced accuracy for for two models are the same, basically. But F one score for our big model is better. Um, it can be explained by the quantization and during the transformation from float. Uh, the floats to integers will lose some precision. It is natural, like natural. And uh, in order to uh, get rid of this uh, wasting, I would say, 
uh, we can uh, reconsider our quantization technique or, for example, in the future, employ uh, on-training quantization. It, of course, will enhance our uh, evaluation and evolution metrics. So if we are satisfied with the results, we can uh, deploy our solution. But if not, we will repeat the whole uh, process from the start. We will start with data logging again, and then uh, up to this validation step. That's all. I will pass my mic to Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you, Darina, for, for the presentation. I think um, it was really nice walk through uh, through the process. Uh, it it it's probably too simple for us, but I'm, I I could foresee that people were um, you know getting it a little bit uh, as is a little complex process to understand. But what what I want to basically uh, wrap up with here is that first of all addressing why we addressed uh, this project and, and what basically we delivered to the end client is classical machine learning application that is called and classified, so to say, as a sensor fusion application, meaning that we have a variety of sensors we can sample, we can um, try to see if, if those sam sampling and sensor data make sense to identify a particular event or I would say a particular uh, course uh, or sequence of events we, we were looking for. So that's that's exactly what uh, what is called sensor fusion. I think the, one more time I want to emphasize that the data validation and and gathering uh, are the crucial steps in the process. So you you actually have to really make sure when you sample the data that you you do not have excessive filtering on the data. So you actually get data clean. And, and that's why we call them raw data. So if, if you have in your system uh, some hardware or software filtering uh, embedded, then apparently uh, you have to be aware of it. So you, you don't have um, precision uh, drop down because of, of some filtering that that doesn't actually help your model to to have this you know small small informative signals to make a decision on. And then um, when when the data is flattened uh, or or the raw data is cleaned from anom uh, anomalies um, and stuff, then then we can do the labeling. And this is really important. This is basically the classical, um, I don't know, uh, fourth century before Christ uh, process. You you observe and you make your decision. If this is what if if something what you see is really the event you you were looking for. So it's it's like a like uh, an apple uh, dropping on a Newton's head, basically. So that's what you're looking for. And then uh, when you label the data, and this is where we have to work super close uh, between uh, research and development or software engineering team and, and the product owner, because it's product owner who understands actually when we see the event, especially if, if the use case uh, of your product is not um, as I would say obvious uh, as the cleaning uh, where we have to make uh, all our rooms and apartments and, and houses ourselves. So we actually know the, the theory, we know how to how to look for the proper or improper cleaning. When it's something more complex, then, then it will take time to, to actually see where the data kind of correlates with what you call event A or event B, so to say. The tool uh, tool chain that Darina mentioned, uh, mostly I would say, uh, first of all, open source and, and free of charge to use. Um, you can obviously, uh, uh, with, with the, uh, Google Workspace, for instance, you can obviously beef up your uh, calculation performance if you get some particular subscriptions and stuff. This tool chain is, it looks a little complex uh, at, at the first look, but it actually in, in my mind, it's it's pretty straightforward for for the developers who are developing embedded code. So I think for for your teams developing products, it would be relatively easy to to migrate the tool chain uh, when when they kind of onboard it with a paradigm of machine learning uh, and and data validation process. 
So um, the process of cleaning the data and also understanding the whole uh, steps in this um, in this process is is somewhat I would say uh, complex. But some of the steps are pretty, you know, easy to understand if if you have uh, classical engineering uh, background. And some of the process would require actually a bit more sophisticated professionals to help you. Uh, through the process and guide you, for instance, what kind of model can be suggested to be used, um, how to migrate in particular manner from, uh, you know, big um, uh, big real, real numbers to, to the, um, you know, integers and stuff like that. So this is where you might actually want to, to have someone like, uh, like Actus team to, to have good, good discussions and, and good, you know, solutions and practices exchange. Um, and the next uh, step would be here, which we didn't cover in this presentation. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of uh, paid tools which can potentially speed up the process of development. And uh, we, we simply didn't use that because we, we didn't have such a big model where we have to really use excessive calculation resources. But even knowing that, you know, we only... Uh, sequenced um, data of five sensors. It, it took some time to, to get model trained, to get data flat and stuff like that. So if you have like a dozen of sensors, uh, that would mean that you will have to reach out for the better calculation uh, performance than a regular PC. And, and for this, you can use some paid tools that offer uh, cloud computation. So that would be my suggestions. Uh, what to do? Um, if you uh, want to to have some project done um, and and you have some ideas uh, where whether tiny email is something what you can use for your products or not, um, we'll be happy to assist you and and you know kind of kick in at any um, any step, uh, any part of your development process of the product, uh, starting probably with some sort of proof of concepts and and then, trying to see if, if there is any traction between your product idea and and if the tiny email can be used for uh, for your particular case. So that's that's where Actos can leverage your your skills and capabilities by enabling our free business areas where we uh, propose you to, to use our skills and and our hands and, and brain so to say. So now um, it's me and Darina talking uh, all the time. So basically we have uh, time for questions and answers. So I will be happy to uh, to get your questions um, at the rest now. So please go ahead and, and ask your questions. You can type in, you can unmute yourself and, and get your question in the air. We have Constantine uh, wanting to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for webinar. Uh, very interesting and uh, useful. Uh, the question is about uh, uh, when we have raw data uh, during processing. And uh, Darina mentioned that uh, we store this raw data for the future adjustment of the model uh, where this data are stored on the device or they transfer to uh, somewhere to cloud and uh, so on and uh, second question uh, are this data uh, already uh, uh, cleaned or you send the clear raw data from the sensors thank you uh, Darina, do you want to take it up or shall I? I can answer the question. So first question was uh, where we store the data. Well, of course, it's up to you. Uh, initially, it is stored on SD card, but unfortunately, um, SD cards cannot contain that, that many data. So uh, you're really limited in this uh, terms. Um, and what we did, uh, we stored a couple of days of data, um, then we uh, transferred to the PC, uh, stood up again uh, the same SD card into the device, and collected the same amount of data, and then again 
again, again, the same process until we collected enough data to train our model. Uh, the second question was, could you, could you please repeat it? Sure. Uh, it's about what uh, data do you store, uh, uh, clean data or uh, raw data from sensors? Uh, or you do this preliminary cleaning and store it for future training or uh, you store raw data for, uh, for adjustment of the model? Mm -hmm. I, I mean data uh, from sensors uh, in uh, in your uh, sequence you mentioned that first you uh, do some cleaning procedure for the data and after that uh, you work uh, run it uh, this data with a model so what data do you store that clean data or the data from sensor that is not cleaned yet Okay, so uh, we store both versions in order we uh, have some troubles with model and uh, we'll face our glass ceiling uh, with that. Um, so it gives us some flexibility because when we store the initial raw data, we can, uh, after a few iterations, simply reduce the frequency uh, or clean or clean, clean it more precise. And we, of course, store the data we train the model on um, to, uh, in the future, uh, we use it to compare to versions of data sets uh, to make uh, simply uh, see this dependency um, between our data and the responses we get from model. Hope it answered your question. Sure. Thank you very much. Good approach. Thank you. I, I think I can add but ba basically um, the data we we get from the sensors is uh, clean and, and that's in the raw data, so to say. Uh, we, we, we do not perform any data fusion on the device. Uh, but when, when what Darina mentioned, when we store the data um, at a PC or cloud or whenever, we actually keep the post uh, data sets like a raw data set and then, uh, you know, after process data set. So because there is no that much power, of course, you know, it's it's a relatively simple data we are, we are uh, kind of acquiring from the sensors, but there, there is no time and there is no sense to actually do any kind of edge computing in this way. So that's uh, just just to wrap it up fully. Okay, uh, we Thank have a you. question. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, we have a question from uh, video. Um, how many iterations your project took uh, before I believe uh, that's that's me adding some some sense into it before we finished with the model that was uh, good enough to uh, to work on and uh, the second question is what are the most risky stages in the process looking from your perspective Darina? Um first I will. <laughs> answer the second question, of course. And the riskiest stage, um, it, uh, it depends on what you put into this question, the riskiest stage. If we're talk we are talking about the most important steps, uh, it is, of course, your data. Uh, on your data depends everything. Uh, the way you process it, the frequency of your data, the way you treat anomalies, the way you treat uh, so please, the way you maybe you can normalize it or not maybe you can uh, apply some time series analysis and delete some trends or not uh, get rid of seasonality or not uh, so in this case data is uh, is tricky and uh, it is the riskiest stage for us i think we had also some some challenges with you know porting uh, the model yeah. finding out that well it doesn't actually work that that well and, and that that kind of points to the first question where the question from video was about um how many iterations we actually did before we came to the model that could be called as a final one oh just roughly uh we, we don't need a roughly. round figure or uh, the, uh, uh from start to end um maybe we tried for more than five or eight times. I cannot tell you the precise number, but uh, it was not quickly. 
for sure, because uh, first we were adjusting our sensors, then we were adjusting the uh, enough uh, f the frequency that worked for us well. Then we uh, fine tuned some cleaning steps, of course, and. Uh, yeah, it was quite quite a mess, and it does not lie into a uh, this classical uh, approach to software. It of course of course requires more time. Well, I think I think one of the things we have to mention also is that uh, you have to recreate the process. So the the way we uh, we were looking for the cleaning is actually doing the cleaning, and it takes time because you know you you cannot. Yeah. Uh, kick a cleaning guy to to clean faster and then pretend that time runs fast as well so that was really yeah. uh really the process so if if the process you try to educate a model with takes like like a whole day to to do and you need to have like 100 to 200 iterations then apparently you're looking into some kind of a timeline you have to spend before your model is is, is trained so that's um um, that's when you do the you know the data exploration and, and you have to do this data exploration so that's that's what obviously takes time um, yes and i as well want to add you slightly approach the topic of model porting um there are a lot of uh there are a lot of tools to do to perform the model porting and on our next webinar we will cover them uh, of course but for st uh case um, but when we are talking about ESP devices, uh, for us, uh, it was difficult to uh, distinguish uh, which uh, layers were compatible or uh, which layers uh, were, um, which one we could make work on our device because uh, the TensorFlow Lite library is uh, limited in its abilities. Uh, so we had to choose our layers carefully. Uh, there is one more question. Thank you, Darina. Uh, one more question from, from Sergey is about actually uh, what kind and if we had any issues during the porting to the real hardware. What what was that, if, if you remember any? Yeah, first off, uh, it was um, the compatibility of uh, some model layers with TensorFlow Lite library and as a conclusion with the whole porting process. And uh, the second, uh, we had uh, some issues with quantization techniques. Uh, we had to uh, look carefully in order to get this quantization uh, uh, coefficients uh, precise. Uh, and not to screw the results, uh, because if you have some uh, even small detail uh, in in this quantization process uh, messed up, then you will mess up the whole uh, your solution, the whole solution. Yep. So basically, uh, yeah, stepping down from from the big tensor model uh, where you can do you know all all bells and whistles. And then, then you want to put it down into the way smaller and computation and, and member footprint embedded um, embedded target. That's that's what really brings some surprises. And apparently, some of the surprises you can see during the porting process, where you simply can see that it doesn't fit, and some surprises you have to really sneak out by doing experiments and looking on you know into the output of the model. So that was. Um, that was the the process all right um any more questions from anyone it looks like it's it's getting a little late probably so uh what i want to um to tell you is that we will um actually host one more webinar um related to exactly the same uh use case like we have been showing you today uh, based on, I would say, uh, one of the most popular uh, Steam platforms in the world called, you know, Espresso ESP32. I believe any uh, of you have been playing with it uh, for sure. And um, during the next webinar, which we'll be hosting um, together with ST um, as uh, one of the authorized partners of ST Microelectronics, we'll be demonstrating how you can actually speed up process of, of particular steps in this 
you know, model training and development using uh, STM32 um, libraries as, you know, QBI and NanoH AI Studio for, I would say, you know, less and more advanced uh, models, uh, training and development, including, you know, the da initial data processing, including uh, porting, and, and you can basically um, see how how all this is wrapped up in a nice uh, ecosystem that is uh, developed by ST Microelectronics. So that would be a really interesting um, way of of actually demonstrating the same uh, use, uh, user um, experience and and also to demonstrate you how the product uh, was developed based on, on the ST tools. For those um, of you um, who will be uh, filling out. Um, the, the feedback form so you can help us uh, be better next time presenting different and you know um, appealing engineering topics to you we would like to to have uh, the form to be filled and then you will be getting um, the slides and and the video recording copy after your form has been processed uh, by our team thank you very much for for your attention tonight it was really nice hosting you. Thank you very much, Darina, for uh, for your deep tech presentation. It was um, in some in some particular cases um, a little bit uh, tough to to be able to you know to move fast as as you can do. But but uh, all in all, it was really nice, uh, really nice journey into how the tiny mail projects can be done. So I'm I'm closing up for. Um, for today. Thank you very much everyone for attending and uh, please uh, stay tuned for uh, for the link and announcement of our next webinar in December. So wish you good evening and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.